Hello, River Valley family. I'm Frank from the Sunny Valley Campus. Glad that you're uh, taking the time to watch this uh, Church at Home video. We have Pastor Tyler bringing the word out of Philippians chapter 3. Uh, but before we do that, uh, please check out these announcements from the weekly and uh, join us in worshiping. Hey River Valley, welcome to the weekly. My name is Natalie Goins and I have a few announcements for you. First things first, I just wanna celebrate that last weekend we had three baptisms happen at our downtown campus and one at our Redwood campus. Praise the Lord for these people choosing to proclaim their allegiance to Jesus in front of their congregation, super awesome. Speaking of that, we will be holding baptisms at our Murphy campus today and a barbecue. So if you're interested in that, find Pastor Joe, find Pastor Brian and they'll get you connected connected. Junior high and high school students, we are moving back to our downtown campus for CAD and Midway. We've been meeting at Redwood for a while, but we're going to move back downtown. Tuesday night, junior hires, uh, we're welcoming you incoming sixth graders. So excited to have you joining us for Midway. That'll be at 6 p.m. Tuesday night, downtown campus. We're going to have a barbecue. It's going to be awesome. CAD will be Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. at the downtown campus. We're gonna be welcoming the fresh meats, or I mean the freshmen. We're gonna have a barbecue, come on out, 6.30 p.m. Super excited, again, that'll be at the downtown campus. Rogue River Campus, you guys also are having a youth night tonight, 6 p.m. Come on out uh, to that at the Rogue River Campus, excited to have you. Ladies, we have another all-campus women's gathering happening at the end of September. If you've been to any of these, you know how much fun they are. You get to you know, connect with other women, eat dessert, just have a great time. I'm super excited for this. This will be happening at our Redwood Campus, September 24th, 6.30 p.m. We're gonna have a fire pit. It's gonna be a great time. And so be sure to check out the program. No registration, just show up. Super excited for this. Grandparents of River Valley or grandparents in our community, we have an incredible opportunity for you to attend a two-day grandparenting seminar that's happening at the end of October. Again, this is a great chance to learn just how to leave a legacy of faith for your grandkids. So be sure to check that out online or in your program. Details are located there. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us for the River Valley Weekly. The Lord bless you guys. Have a great service.
Today we're in Philippians 3.17, so I'm going to dive right in. Paul says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have had us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I, as, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This is God's word. We're in a series called Joyride, cruising through Paul's letter to the Philippians. And even though Paul is stuck in a Roman prison with lots of reasons to either quit or complain, he's still joyfully moving forward. Last week, we read him say, One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize. So he takes his foot off the left pedal, jams it down onto the right pedal, pursuing his life's passion full throttle. So last week's teaching was about resisting complacency with passion, resisting apathy with hunger, resisting indifference with making a difference. When we hear, just go with the flow, bro, we say no. If we're not moving forward, we're stuck or we're moving backwards, especially if we're on a hill. And we feel like we're on a lot of hills today, right? Like, like vertical or starlight if you live in Grants Pass. He continues this metaphor of movement in today's text, which I just read at the end of chapter 3. Not to brag, but to inspire us. Verse 17, we read, join together in following my example." And then keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Uh, that Greek word for live is actually the word walk, literally. Uh, there's no cars back then, so Paul might call this series a joy walk or something. But uh, he uses the same word in verse 18. Hey guys, watch out because many live, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. So we know we're supposed to be moving in motion on mission, but this begs a very important question. On this joy ride called life, how do I know if I'm heading in the right direction? How do I know where I'm going or how to get there? How do I know if I'm pursuing that which is meaningful and significant and important? How do I know that I'm becoming the person that God's intended me to be? It's like the, the, the disciple Thomas once asked Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know how to get there? How can we know the way? 
older people, please don't laugh at me, but as I start to measure some seasons of my life in decades now and not in years, I start to wonder and worry about wasting it. It can be a source of anxiety in my life. And maybe this is uniquely felt for us in the younger generations with more options and opportunities for us than ever before. And maybe it's that sense of FOMO, fear of missing out. Like when you're at the restaurant and the menu's five pages long, front and back. And sometimes this anxiety, this fear, this unease can cause us to walk in unhelpful and harmful directions. So today we're going to talk about satanic shortcuts, the way of the cross, and our final destination. So first, satanic shortcuts. One of my favorite characters in the Jesus story is Peter. If you've been watching the Chosen series, I think they cast him really well. Peter is almost always first. He's the first person to speak up, usually saying something stupid, but everyone else is thinking it. He's the first person to act, whether it's stepping onto the water to walk on water or pulling out a sword to slash someone's ear who's trying to arrest Jesus. Peter is often first, right? And in Mark 8 and Matthew 13, we see this. We see Peter taking a central role. And first, it looks really great. Peter's looking awesome. Jesus asks his disciples what people are saying about him. There's lots of good answers. Yeah, Jesus, some people say you're like John the Baptist. Some people say you're a prophet. Some even say you're as, as big, as great as Elijah. Then Jesus asks his disciples, but who do you think that I am? After a hush falls over them, Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're God's promised king, even greater than Elijah. Jesus praises Peter for this revelation and even says, on this rock, I will build my church. Either Peter or his confession or both. So Peter's feeling really good. He's feeling like the rock. And then Jesus starts talking about the route he's going to take. His impending suffering and death. Uh, this is completely shocking, a departure from the script of what the king is supposed to do. And so Peter takes it on himself to educate Jesus. Have you ever been there? Uh, you've got some great ideas you think Jesus needs to hear? Uh, if only Jesus would implement your plan. It's right, so Mark 8, 31. Then Jesus began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things, to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and rise after three days. He spoke openly about this, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you picture the scene? Peter's like, hey, Jesus, can I have a word in private? Uh, Jesus, you can't talk like this, man. Uh, this is not the path you're supposed to take. Jesus, looking at his disciples, turns to Peter and says loudly, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Now, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but never Satan. And I cannot imagine getting called Satan by Jesus. Peter goes from pillar of the church, rock of the church, to Satan really fast. What's up with that? See, when I think of satanic, I think of Ouija boards. I think of sacrificing goats in graveyards or, you know, really evil stuff like the Holocaust or Hitler or terrorists or whatever. But what does Jesus say here is actually satanic? Get behind me, Satan, for you are not thinking of God's concerns, but human concerns. That really changes the definition of satanic, doesn't it? Not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. It is satanic to go our own way, to do our own thing, to get out ahead of Jesus and take shortcuts. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. So let's look at some of these satanic shortcuts back in Paul's letter. Philippians 3.18, Paul says, For as I have as often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. So don't miss this. As Paul is, is writing the letter, he's tearing up. He's crying because of these enemies of the cross of Christ. These are probably people who are close to his heart. Self-proclaimed Christians or former Christians who are going in a dangerous direction, a way that seems right but leads to destruction. So shortcut number one I'm calling no suffering street. Maybe we could call it easy street. Now where do we see this shortcut in the text? Paul says they are enemies of the cross of Christ. 
Notice that he calls them enemies of Christ's cross and not just enemies of Christ in general, not just generic enemies of God. What's wrong with the cross? What is it about the cross that they are opposing? Again, we should go back to Peter's interaction with Jesus. What really bothered Peter when Jesus started talking about a path of pain and shame and weakness and death? Peter wanted a king without a cross, a savior without suffering. And he wasn't alone in this view. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block, a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So in other words, when people heard the message that a crucified convict is savior of the world, that seemed to be foolishness or even scandalous. See, from Peter's interaction with Jesus to today, there's always a temptation to take the path of least resistance, to avoid suffering at all costs, hard conversations, unpopular stands, serving others. It's easier to take the bypass, to sidestep and walk around, sometimes literally, at Fred Meyer, hypothetically speaking, right? And when we think of internal pain and anxiety and suffering, there are so many options available to us to help us dull and numb and temporarily escape our pain and stress. We can self-medicate with things like alcohol or pot or food or Netflix or pornography or scrolling social media, video games or games on our phones or whatever, but these are shortcuts. They don't help and they often make things so much worse in the long run. So shortcut number one is no suffering street. Shortcut number two is pleasure parkway. Paul says in Philippians 3.19, their God is their stomach. There's a similar cross-reference in Romans 16.17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you've learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. I saw this guy a while ago who had a shirt that said, I have the body of a God. Unfortunately, it's Buddha. (laughs) I don't know if you've seen that shirt before, but that's a great illustration, right? Their God is their belly. Uh, That doesn't just mean overeating, although it certainly could mean that. It means that we're serving our impulses, living from our loudest feelings, desires, and cravings. Notice that these aren't usually our deepest desires for significance, loving relationships, long-term health. But they're they're usually our most demanding and immediate desires, like pleasure from food or substances or sex or the impulse for approval and praise, for a sense of safety or the impulse to vindicate or tell someone off when they have wronged us. And our microwave culture makes this shortcut particularly appealing. Uh, We can order things from Amazon at the stoplight in 10 seconds. We've never had more access to anything in human history. Money, goods, services, knowledge. You have more at your fingertips than a billionaire did in 1921, 100 years ago. And while I'd never want to live in any other time, we're probably not more virtuous for constantly taking these shortcuts. It's discipled us in some unhelpful ways, I think. Why? Because we often trade the ultimate for the immediate. We trade our future for our present. It's my money and I need it now. Who cares about later and the debt and the interest and all that? Of course, there's no greater example of this than the cultural commentator, Homer Simpson. You might have heard of him. Uh, His wife Marge confronts him one day and says that one day he'll regret not spending more time with his kids. And Homer says wisely or foolishly, that's a problem for future Homer. Man, I don't envy that guy. And then he chugs a jar of mayonnaise and vodka. So he valued present Homer way more than future Homer. See, pleasure is a gift from God. It is, but it's not something to pursue. If you're on a joyride, if you're on a road trip for pleasure, you won't find it. But if you're on a joyride for something more meaningful, time with friends, viewing the Grand Canyon, or or whatever, pleasure will be a byproduct of the experience. But parkway pleasure ends in destruction. 
Shortcut number three is the self-reliance route. Verse 19 says their glory is in their shame. Now some commentators tie this one with that last one, that these enemies of the cross who serve their bellies are glorying in their shame. They're justifying their sin. They're even bragging about it. And that word shame often is associated with sexual sin, using God's great gift of sex in a degrading and dehumanizing way outside of marriage. And so people who glory in their shame could be those who call evil good, who brag about their sin, or say, hey, I'm free in Christ, I can do whatever I want. But since we already kind of looked at that with their God is their belly, I want to look at an alternative interpretation. Another interpretation is that these people were more like the Judaizers, who we've been studying the last couple weeks. These were the legalistic Jewish people who tried to get new converts to follow the old Jewish laws. So these were people who bragged about their circumcision, their ethnicity, and their spiritual experience. Their glory, which is their spiritual accomplishments, is actually to their shame because that's what they're relying on before God. So if Pleasure Parkway is the satanic shortcut of the more lax and liberal, then the self-reliance route is the shortcut of the more traditional, religious, and conservative. The self-reliance route is the shortcut of saying, I am good on my own. I don't need the cross of Christ. I'm going to stand before God with my resume in hand. Look at how good of a person I've been. Look at how committed to my family and faith I was. Look at all the money I've given away and how much I've served and helped. This posture inevitably leads to a sense of superiority and scorn over those who aren't as accomplished or advanced or hardworking as I am. And this is evidenced by a prayerlessness and lack of compassion. You see, the self-reliance route leads us to destruction because it turns us into scornful, prideful people. And it reveals that our trust is in our own path, like Peter, instead of following Jesus in trust and dependence. Fourth, shortcut number four is temporary terrace. At the end of verse 19 says, their mind is set on earthly things. It makes me think again of, Je of Jesus' rebuke. Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about God's concerns, but human ones. You're not thinking about God's world, but the, the, this present world. Later on, near the end of his life, Paul will experience a huge betrayal. In 2 Timothy 4.10, we read, For Demas in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. See, in Paul's final days, his co-worker Demas split. Things got too hard. This present world and the comforts therein were more appealing than working for the next. Again, it's kind of like trading the ultimate for the immediate, the future for the present. Demas is more concerned about today than tomorrow. And he abandons Paul right before Paul is executed. We could even call this like a practical atheism. We might believe in God, but don't live like his opinion, plan, or priorities are that important. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. In 1 John 2, 15, don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the pride of possessions, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So we've seen some shortcuts to avoid, but what is the way that we should go? What's the positive, you know, what's, what's our solution here? Let's go back to that scene of Peter rebuking Jesus, and then Jesus rebuking him back. Get behind me, Satan. As mentioned earlier, the Satan title is new. We don't really see that anywhere else in Scripture like this. But that phrase, get behind me, is not new. Did you know Peter's heard this phrase before? This is not the first time he's heard this command from Jesus. That word for behind me is the same word that he's used with Peter and his disciples in Mark 1, 17. Come follow me. Same word. And I'll show you how to fish for people. Peter's problem is that he's out in front, out of head of Jesus. He assumes he knows better than Jesus the way to go. But Jesus says, no, get behind me. Follow me. Uh, fall in line, soldier. See, the way of the cross, the way that leads to life, 
is in following Jesus. I think scripturally, this looks like joining him and then in time, looking more like him. So first joining him, we read in John 10, 7, therefore Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then famously, John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So joining him means we leave everything for him. Pleasure and pain, failures and accomplishments, we give it all to him. We recognize that he died for us so that now we can live for him. And this joining of Jesus is so close, so personal, so intimate, it's as if we've become the same person. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So as we join Jesus, as we start to follow him, we begin to look more like him. When you hang out with someone for a long time, they start to rub off on you. After rebuking Peter, Jesus continues in Mark 8, 34, calling the crowd along with his disciples to say, hey guys, listen up. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. And then Luke's gospel, in Luke's gospel, he adds the word daily. Let him take up his cross daily and follow me. See, in the ancient world, they would say something to students like, may you be covered in the dust of your teacher. Following so close to him on the dirty streets that his dust gets kicked up on you. You're that close. You won't miss a thing. You hear everything the teacher's saying and copy every interaction and watch your master at work and mimic them. And Jesus eventually will carry a cross, a symbol of redemptive suffering for others. And so like Jesus, his followers will do the same. Some of them will literally die for their faith. We think of brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now. But for many of us, this is a death to short-term impulses and pleasures and priorities and sins so that what's really important can happen, namely following Jesus, serving others, suffering and hurting for what's right. Now, how does Jesus' command to carry our cross intersect with his promise that his burden is light? Matthew eleven thirty, 30, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So is it difficult or hard? Is following Jesus easy or hard? Uh, dying to self or resting in him? I like how Andrew Murray resolves the contradiction. He said, it's not the yoke that's heavy, it's our resistance to it. It's not the yoke that's heavy, it's our resistance to it. Now, the most miserable person in the world is the person who has one foot in the world and one foot in the Lord. Right? Straddling the fence is always uncomfortable. Too much of the world in them to enjoy the Lord and too much of the Lord in them to enjoy the world. Another way to put this, another way to resolve this tension is that there's some things in me that need to die in order for me to truly rest in him. It will take a cross to put to death in me that which prevents real rest and wholeness. And I think Jesus' burden is also bearable in that he carries it with us. He doesn't abandon us or leave us alone. And he gives us other people that have walked this path before us and walk it with us. See, in this Philippian letter, we've watched Jesus. We've watched Paul. We've watched Timothy and Epaphroditus and the Philippian Christians themselves carry their crosses, suffering joyfully for the sake of others. And this is what I think Paul is referencing in verse 17 again. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have had us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. I heard a story once of a young man visiting a new church. After attending for a couple of weeks, the pastor approaches the young man and strikes up a conversation. And eventually he asks, so, I mean, do you think you're going to stick around? And the young man paused and kind of thought for a minute and said, you know, I'm not sure yet. I think I need to talk to some of the older people in the church. And this kind of caught the pastor off guard. He said, well, I've never heard that before. Uh, why is talking to some of the older church members important to you, a young guy? 
And the young man looks right at the pastor and with conviction says, because if I stay one day, I'm going to become them. I'm going to become one of them. One day I'm going to look like and talk like and act like they do, in large part because of the formation that happens at this church. We are shaped by the people and places we spend time at. And, and yes, some leaders and churches have let us down recently. Many have heard about a local pastor who stepped down for sexual sin recently. And we pray for him. And I hope you pray for us as pastors. Man, this job sometimes feels radioactive. I hope you pray for us and for your leaders. But despite those who have really messed up, many leaders have been great role models for us in this church and in many of the churches in our city. And, and they're people who we can follow and commemorate, especially as they follow Christ. And so many of you in this church, you help me better follow Jesus. And I hope I'm doing that for you as well. Well, all this leads us to our final destination, Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I don't know if you're following the news. We're hearing, hearing all sorts of reports that citizens of the United States are stuck in Afghanistan. I don't know very much about it. I don't really want to get into it. But for whatever reason, the United States government is unable or unwilling to escort them home. And we continue to pray for the situation. But notice what Paul says about citizens of heaven. He says, we eagerly await a savior who has the power to bring everything under his control. How comforting, how relieving. We will never be left alone in this foreign place. We do not have a Jesus whose hands are tied, a Jesus unable to save, or a Jesus unwilling to save. He is able, he is willing, and he will do it. And so our final destination is our transformation. We will be like him, like Jesus. That's where this joy ride is headed. We'll be perfect and complete and fulfilled and lacking nothing. And imagine everything significant that you've ever pursued, every area of your life that you've tried to change, Every noble goal, dream, and desire that you've had will finally be reached. Whatever failure, shortcomings, or setbacks, or sin that you've experienced now will finally be undone and rectified then. Let's give John the last word here. 1 John 2.28 And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time here together. Lord, for the things you've taught us in this Philippian series. God, I do pray. I pray that we would not trade the ultimate for the immediate. That we would not take the shortcuts that the world and Satan so often offers us. Lord, but we would take the way of the cross. The way that joins you. The, the way that becomes more like you. Lord, we would follow so close behind you that it would be like we'd be covered in your dust. Thank you that you're a God who wants us to follow you and that you sent Jesus so that we could do that. Thank you for uh, Jesus' death for us. In his name we ask these things. Amen. River Valley, I hope that message blessed you from Pastor Tyler. I hope it was encouraging to you uh, to follow the example of Christ and treasure your citizenship in heaven. Have a great week.